We have now looked at the first three books which constitute together part one of this epic and we move on to part two. Part one, as you know, <coughs> is primarily concerned with Ashwapati's yoga <coughs> and although we rushed through the entire book two <coughs> and even cantos three, four, five of book one which also deal with Ashwapati's yoga in a great hurry I hope I have said enough to indicate the nature of this yoga and the goal of this yoga. And as I have repeatedly emphasized, Ashwapati's yoga is quintessentially Sri Aurobindo's own yoga. And it seems to me that may be the reason why the name of Ashwapati doesn't at all occur in the entire part one. It's all about Ashwapati's yoga, but the name Ashwapati doesn't e occur even once because I don't know how a poet, my poet's mind works. When Sri was describing this, probably it was for him so intimately autobiographical that uh, in the enterprise he must have momentarily forgotten that this was all about Ashwapati he was writing and not about himself. The, the word Ashwapati comes much later, it comes in this book and uh, it comes for the first time on page 369. <clears throat> That is not of much interest, I just <clears throat> wanted to mention this. Now, with the beginning of book part two, we have a different kind of poetic enterprise here. Books four and five, as I pointed out, together cover ground which you don't find in Vyasa's Savitri. In the Mahabharata, there is not a great deal of description either of Savitri's childhood or her growth through youth. All that we are told is that one day suddenly Ashwapati realizes that no suitor has come forward to claim Savitri's hand and he is anxious as a good Indian father. It's his duty to find a suitable husband for a daughter, so he sends her out into the open world. But here the development is entirely different. Uh, Sri Aurobindo takes a great delight in describing Savitri's childhood. Uh, Canto 1 of Book 4, as you can see, is called The Birth and Childhood of the Flame. Flame here in Savitri. <coughs> The first thing you would notice here is that the wonderful descriptions of seasons and as I mentioned earlier, the two seasons which seem to be Shorabindo's favorites are the monsoons and spring. So if you want to see how Shorabindo describes the seasons, you have to open at page 349 about eight lines from the bottom of that page. <clears throat> Next through its fiery swoon or clotted knot, rain tide burst in upon torn wings of heat, startled with lightnings, airs, unquiet drowse, lashed with life-giving streams the torpid soil, Overcast with flare and sound and storm-winged dark, the star-defended doors of heaven's dim sleep, or from the gold eye of her paramour, 
covered with packed cloud veils the earth's brown face. Long description. It ends almost on the last line of page 350. The last two lines being, or only the muddy creep of sinking floods, or only a whisper and green toss of trees. The entire thing, a page and about a quarter, is a wonderful description of a typical Indian monsoon season, rainy season, and it's a wonderful, great description here. I would like you to note it. We don't have the time to read this. We move on to the next description, which probably I will read, which is the description of spring. And Savitri is born towards the end of this season. On page 351, once again, about 10 lines from the bottom of that page, this is a description which you will not find in any book of English poetry, because an English poet can't describe spring in these words. It has, he has to be an Indian. You'll find descriptions like this in Kalidas. You'll find descriptions like this in Sanskrit poets, but not anywhere in English poetry, because this entire sensuousness is of a different kind of sensuousness. And when it comes to that, Sri Aurobindo remains unexcelled. I will read that description. Then spring, an ardent lover, leaped through leaves and caught the earth bride in his eager clasp. See, he says, then spring, an ardent lover, leaped through leaves. He, he leapt through leaves, spring leapt through leaves, he says, and caught the earth bride in his eager clasp. <clears throat> his advent was a fire of eye-rised hues. His arms were a circle of the arrival of joy. His voice was a call to the transcendent sphere, whose secret touch upon our mortal lives keeps ever new the thrill that made the world, remolds an ancient sweetness to new shapes, and guards intact, unchanged by death and time, the answer of our hearts to nature's charm, and keeps forever new, yet still the same, the throb that ever wakes to the old delight, and beauty and rapture and the joy to live. His coming brought the magic and the spell. At his touch, life's tired heart grew glad and young, he made joy a willing prisoner in her breast. His grasp was a young god's upon earth's limbs. Changed by the passion of his divine outbreak, he made her body beautiful with his kiss. Impatient for felicity, he came, high fluting with the coil's happy voice, his peacock turban trailing on the trees. His breath was a warm summons to delight. The dense, voluptuous azure was his gaze. Wonderful description, he says. Read those lines again. Impatient for felicity, he came, high fluting with the coil's happy voice. His peacock turban trailing on the trees. His breath was a warm summons to delight. The dense, voluptuous azure was his gaze. A soft celestial urge surprised the blood, rich with the instinct of God's sensuous joys. Revealed in beauty, a cadence was abroad, insistent on the rapture thrill in life. Immortal movements touched the fleeting hours. A godlike, packed intensity of sense made it a passionate pleasure even to breathe. All sights and voices wove a single charm. The life of the enchanted globe became a storm of sweetness and of light and song, a revel of color and of ecstasy, a hymn of rays, a litany of cries, a strain of choral priestly music sang and swung on the swaying censer of the trees, a sacrifice of perfume filled the hours. Ashoka's burned in crimson spots of flame, pure like the breath of an unstained desire. White jasmines haunted the enamored air. 
pale mango blossoms fed the liquid voice of the love maddened coil and the brown bee muttered in fragrance mid the honey buds the sunlight was a great god's golden smile all nature was at beauty's festival after describing it in great detail he still wants to do something in so one line he says all nature was at beauty's festival now it is here <clears throat> in this season savitri is born and this birth of savitri he introduces very quietly very softly he says on page 353 a silence in the noise of earthly things immutably revealed the secret word a mightier influx filled the oblivious clay a lamp was lit a sacred image made a mediating ray had touched the earth bridging the gulf between man's mind and god's its brightness linked our transience to the unknown says a lamp was lit he says a sacred image made a lamp was lit a sacred image made and what was this image for a mediating ray had touched the earth this was a mediating ray that is going to bridge earth and the heavens a mediating ray had touched the earth bridging the gulf between man's mind and god's savitri was going to provide build this wonderful golden bridge between man's limited mind and god's mind a few lines down the page one had returned from the transcendent planes and bore anew the load of mortal breath he says one has returned savitri's birth is not here it's not as if the divine mother came here for the first time she has been coming here repeatedly whenever there has been a crisis in the evolutionary path the avatar has always appeared in some form or the other the divine mother had taken several births before this is one more that's what he's saying one had returned from the transcendent planes and bore a new the load of mortal breath who had striven of old with our darkness and our pain why does mother come here to help us strive with our darkness and our pain she took again her divine unfinished task the unfinished task of realizing here the glory of the divine perfection here in forms made of clay that is the that is the goal that is the purpose for which she keeps coming and this time again she has come survivor of death and the eonic years once more with her fathomless heart she fronted time again there was renewed again revealed the ancient closeness by earth region veiled the secret contact broken off in time a consanguinity of earth and heaven between the human portion toiling here and an as yet unborn limitless force and then a few lines later he says for since upon this blind and whirling globe earth plasm first quivered with the illumining mind and life invaded the material sheath afflicting in conscience with the need to feel since the infinity silence woke a word a mother wisdom works in nature's breast <laughs> to pour delight on the heart of toil and want and press perfection on life's stumbling paths impose heaven sentience on the obscure abyss and make dumb matter conscious of its god so to make the dumb matter conscious of the god that is make dumb matter conscious of the god that is involved in matter this is the purpose of evolution evolution is not just a mechanical unfoldment of some energy that is implicit that is hidden in nature hidden in matter it is the holocaust of the supreme it is the supreme who has become the inconscient so earth and matter in none else but god himself who has taken this form and gradually he is unfolding himself he is growing 
towards his super conscience. Although our fallen minds forget to climb, although our human stuff resists or breaks, she keeps her will that hopes to divinize clay. We forget why we are here. We are lost in the supermarkets here, but she keeps her will and she comes back and lifts us, pushes us. Failure cannot repress, defeat overthrow. Failure cannot repress her, defeats cannot overthrow her will. Time cannot weary her, nor the void subdue. The ages have not made her passion less. She is not saying, oh, how often do I have to come? How dumb is man? She comes like a mother. Every time she comes, she brings all the heaven's love. The ages have not made her passion less. No victory, she admits, of death and or fate. Always she drives the soul to new attempt. Always her magical infinitude forces to aspire the inert brute elements as one who has all infinity to waste. She scatters the seed of the eternal strength on a half-animate and crumbling mold, plants heaven's delight in the heart's passionate mire, pours Godhead seekings into a bare beast frame, hides immortality in a mask of death. This is what she has done. Once more, that will, that will, who has been repeatedly coming to us, who has repeatedly giving us this push, that will, he says, once more that will put on an earthly shape. That will, the Supreme Mother's will, once more put on an earthly shape. A mind empowered from truth's immutable seat was framed for vision and interpreting act, and instruments were sovereignly designed to express divinity in terrestrial signs, outlined by the pressure of this new descent, a lovelier body formed than earth had known. So a body was formed, the kind of body which the earth had never known before. You see how he describes the seasons, then comes to spring, and then introduces this Savitri's birth here, and immediately talks about the significance of her birth in these terms. So he is uh, he's aware, we are told that Savitri's birth is in fact the birth of an avatar. Savitri is an avatar who has been born here. She is the Divine Mother, Supreme Mother who has been born. Then the next canto is called the growth of the flame. And how Savitri grew up, what she looked like, all this in great detail here. I'll read and once again some excerpts, page 360. What did Savitri learn? She had to learn as a young girl various arts, crafts, philosophy, all these things she had to learn and she describes this on page 360 about 10, 12 lines from the bottom of that page. Intense philosophies pointed earth to heaven. Most philosophies that we read don't point earth to heaven or on foundations broad as cosmic space appraise the earth mind to superhuman heights. Overpassing lines that please the outward eyes but hide the sight of that which lives within sculpture and painting. She learned philosophy, she learned sculpture and painting, concentrated sense upon an inner vision's motionless verge, revealed a figure of the invisible, unveiled all nature's meaning in a form or caught into a body of the divine. She also learned architecture, the architecture of the infinite, discovered here its out inward musing shapes, captured into wide breadths of soaring stone. Then, music. Music brought down celestial yearnings. Song held the merged heart absorbed in rapturous depths, linking the human with the cosmic cry. 
the world interpreting movements of the dance, molded idea and mood to a rhythmic sway and posture. Crafts, he also learned various crafts. Crafts minute in subtle lines, eternized a swift moment's memory, or showed in a carving sweep, a cup's design, the underlying patterns of the unseen. Then, poems. Poems in largeness cast like moving worlds and meters surging with the ocean's voice translated by grandeurs locked in nature's heart and thrown now into a crowded glory of speech, the beauty and sublimity of her forms, the passion of her moments and her moods, lifting the human world nearer to the gods. So this is a description of the various arts and crafts, poetry, philosophy, etc. Savitri learnt, and then you have very beautiful descriptions of what she was like. This young flame, young Savitri, maybe in her mid-teens, what was she like? Page 363. <clears throat> Middle of that page, about 12 lines from the top. A friend, and yet too great holy to know, she looked friendly enough, but she always looked too great holy to know. You never felt that you had known her enough. Too great holy to know. She walked in their front towards a greater light, their leader and queen over their hearts and souls. So wherever she was, she was a leader and a queen of their hearts and souls. One close to their bosoms, yet divine and far. So close, so human, you would even answer questions like, should I eat bindi or bangan? She never said, no, this is too trivial a question, I won't answer. She answered all these questions. And yet he says, one close to their bosoms, yet divine and far. Admiring and amazed, they saw her stride, attempting with a godlike rush and leap, heights for their human stature too remote. Or with a slow, great, many-sided toil, pushing towards aims, they hardly could conceive. Her nature was such that she would push people around her to aims, to deeds, which they thought they would never be even capable of conceiving. Did I do this? How did I do this? Because Savitri pushed you into doing these things. So to be with her, to be in her presence was a summons to rise to the full stature of your being. That was the, her presence. Yet forced to be the satellites of her sun, they moved unable to forego her light, desiring, they clutched at her with outstretched hands or followed stumbling in the path she made. A few lines down the same page. Some felt her with their soul and thrilled with her. A greatness felt near, yet beyond mind's grasp. To see her was a summons to adore. To see her was a summons to adore. To be near her drew a high communion's force. So men worship a God too great to know, too high too vast to wear a limiting shape. So you wonder, who is this person who has put on this limiting human shape because you are convinced that this person is not human? That was Savitri's presence, that's what she made people feel. They feel a presence and obey a might, adore a love whose rapture invades their breasts, to a divine ardor, quickening the heartbeats, a law they follow, greatening heart and life. Open to the breath 
is a new diviner air, open to man is a freer, happier world. He sees high steps climbing to self and light. All this is a description of Savitri's. Down that page, about four lines from the bottom of that page, once again, some turn to her against their nature's bent. Some wanted to revolt against her, but they just couldn't help, couldn't help bending towards her. She says, some turn to her against their nature's bent, divided between wonder and revolt. You don't know whether to wonder at her presence or to revolt against her. To one, divided between wonder and revolt, drawn by her charm and mastered by her will, possessed by her, her striving to possess, impatient subjects, their tied longing hearts, hugging the bonds close of which they most complained, hugging the bonds close of which they most complained, murmured at a yoke they would have wept to lose. <laughs> See, they felt that she had tied them to a yoke. Oh, this is a yoke, this is a kind of tyranny Savitri has imposed on us. But if somebody suggested, would you like to be freed from this? They said, no, <laughs> we like this. So he says, the murmured at a yoke they would have wept to lose. The splendid yoke of her beauty and her love. Others pursued her with life's blind desires and claiming all of her as their lonely own, hastened to engross her sweetness meant for all. Some people wanted to make her their exclusive friend, whereas she had love for the whole world and people felt Jealous when she gave the same love to other people. That was Savitri. The splendid yoke of her beauty and her love. Others pursued her with life's blind desires and claiming all of her as their lonely own, hastened to engross her sweetness meant for all. A few lines down that page. Some drawn unwillingly by her divine sway endured it like a sweet but alien spell. Unable to mount to levels too sublime, they yearn to draw her down to their own earth. Some people couldn't rise to the level that she was expecting them to rise to. Say they, they tried to pull her down to their level. So they wanted to see whether she could come down to their level. Unable to mount to levels too sublime, they yearn to draw her down to their own earth or forced to center around her their passionate lives. They hope to bind to their hearts human needs, her glory and grace that had enslaved their souls. Next page, 366. About, about six lines from the bottom of that page. Among the many who came drawn to her, Nowhere she found her partner of high tasks, the comrade of her soul, her other self, who was made with her like God and nature, one. Everybody admired her, but nobody felt that he was equal to her. He could be her companion on equal terms. Some near approached, were touched, caught fire, then failed. Too great was her demand, too pure her force. Thus lightening earth around her like a sun, yet in her inmost sky an orb aloof, a distance severed her from those most close, puissant apart her soul as the gods live. She lived amidst people, but nobody could claim her as his own, so there was no companion. And so Sri Aurobindo talks about it on page 367 in more precise terms, about 10 lines from the bottom. Admired, unsought, intangible to the grasp, 
Her beauty and flaming strength were seen afar, like lightning playing with the fallen day, a glory unapproachably divine. All the young men in that place where she lived, they all found her a glory unapproachably divine. No equal heart came close to join her heart. No transient earthly love assailed her calm. No hero passion had the strength to seize. Nobody had that heroism required to captivate her. No eyes demanded her replying eyes. No eyes had even the courage to look into her eyes. A power within her or the imperfect flesh. Thus the self-protecting genius in our clay divined the goddess in the woman's shape and drew back from a touch beyond its kind. The earth nature bound in sense life's narrow make. The hearts of men are amorous of clay kin. Human beings are amorous of clay kin. They can only love others who are like them at their level and bear not spirits lone and high who bring fire intimations from the deathless plains too vast for souls not born to mate with heaven. So, that is what he is trying to... This is the part of the story that no young man approached to claim Savitri's hand in marriage. This is what the poet wants to say that people admired her, people were awed by her, people respected her, people were charmed by her, but no young man could ever come anywhere near and look into her eyes because he says, all, as he says, all worshipped marvelingly, none dared to claim. Her mind sat high, pouring its golden beams. Her heart was a crowded temple of delight. A single lamp lit in perfection's house, a bright, pure image in a priestless shrine. Amid those encircling lives her spirit dwelt, apart in herself until her hour of fate. This is, in brief, as these two cantos describe. The first one describes Savitri's birth, and the second one, as the title says, growth of the flame. Now we come to a point when Savitri is about 18 or 19 years of age and one day Ashwapati, this is where the word Ashwapati occurs for the first time on page 369, about the middle of that page, King Ashwapati listened through the ray that's the, that's the first occurrence of Ashwapati. One day, Ashwapati hears a voice. On page 370, <clears throat> what does the voice say? O force compelled, fate driven, earth born race, O petty adventurers, in an infinite world and prisoners of a dwarf humanity, how long will you tread the circling tracks of mind around your little self and petty things? This is what the voice says. O oh, force compelled, addressed to all of us, force compelled, fate driven, earth born race, O oh, petty adventurers, in an infinite world and prisoners of a dwarf humanity. How long will you tread the circling tracks of mind around your little self and petty things? But not for a changeless littleness where you meant, not for vain repetition where you built. Out of the immortal substance you were made, your actions can be swift revealing steps, your life a changeful mold for growing gods, a seer, a strong creator is within. 
the immaculate grandeur broods upon your days. Almighty powers are shut in nature's cells. A greater destiny waits you in your front. This transient earthly being, if he wills, can fit his acts to a transcendent scheme. He who now stares at the world with ignorant eyes, hardly from the inconscient night aroused, that look at images and not at truth, can fill those orbs with an immortal sight. You Yet shall the Godhead grow within your hearts. You shall awake into the spirit's air and feel the breaking walls of mortal mind and hear the message which left life's heart dumb and look through nature with sun-gazing lids and blow your conch shells at the eternal's gate. Authors of earth's high change, to you it is given to cross the dangerous spaces of the soul and touch the mighty mother stark awake and meet the omnipotent in this house of flesh and make of life the million-bodied one. The earth you tread is a border screen from heaven. The life you lead conceals the light you are. The light, the life you lead, he says, the life you lead conceals the light you are. Now, Ashwapati was sitting one day quietly. Ashwapati was fond of his daughter like any father. Ashwapati is a great yogi. But when he's come down, Savitri is going up. So he has forgotten temporarily, momentarily, Savitri's great destiny. So he was protecting her with the fond love of a father. And suddenly one day he hears this voice which reminds him, which reminds the whole of humanity of the great destiny that's awaiting it only if it tried to transcend the limitations of the human mind. And this entire thing is uh, up to 372. <clears throat> this is what the voice says. I'll read a little more. We have only two, three minutes left, so we'll take a break. Uh, page 371. <clears throat> the soul's deep intimations come in vain. In vain is the unending line of seers. The sages ponder in unsubstantial light. The poets lend their voice to outward dreams. A homeless fire inspires the prophet tongues. Heaven's flaming lights descend and back return. Because man is unable to recognize heaven's light, man is unable to make use of divine grace, this light repeatedly comes and has to go back. That's what he's saying. A homeless fire inspires the prophet tongues. Heaven's flaming lights descend and back return. The luminous eye approaches and retires. Eternity speaks. None understands its word. Eternity has spoken several times. It spoke in Bengali when Ram Krishna Paramahams came. It spoke in Tamil when Raman Maharshi came. But who is willing to listen to the eternal words of eternity? Eternity speaks, none understands its word. Fate is unwilling, the abyss denies. The inconscient, mindless waters block all done. Only a little lifted is mind's screen. The wise who know, See but one half of truth. The strong climb hardly to a low peaked height. The hearts that yearn are given one hour to love. His tale, half told, falters the secret bard. And the voice says, The gods are still too few in mortal forms. We stop here and come back at four. 
ten.